Welcome to Successful Parenting, where we, Jackie Rue and Robin Choquette, share practical skills for families to build resilience and healthy connections. As practicing professionals and parents ourselves, we hope this podcast is a resource for parents to grow, reflect, and learn more about themselves and their children. Our approach is simple, tangible, and most importantly, we lead with compassion for the integrity of the families we serve. This podcast should not be taken as medical advice and is intended for informational purposes only. We love our work and we can't wait to watch families gain confidence and open themselves up to new ways of successful parenting. Hi, Jackie. Hey, Robin. How you doing? I am pretty good today. How are you? Well, pretty much everything I did today kind of turned to crap. So uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing pretty well. It was, you know, it was one of those days where every everything I attempted, uh, utter fail, every delivery that was supposed to come did not. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just hoping I don't screw anything up too much tonight. So uh, how was your day? Oh, it was... <laughs> Today it wasn't bad. It really wasn't bad. There was something that happened funny today, but now, and I was going to tell you about it, but now I can't remember. I'm thinking about that. Okay. Well then, because I was going to do something funny. Okay, Jackie. (laughs) Do you want to tell us a joke? I am going to tell a joke because you know what? That's the only way to start. You know what? If you're a parent out there, you know that there's some days that everything you try to do just does go to crap. And I think one thing that Robin and I, you know, we talk a lot about is our best day is our best day, whatever that looks like. Right. So I was actually talking to a kid and a teacher and I've gotten many calls recently. Our biggest call-ins have been about struggling with homework and struggling, getting kids to do homework and just getting kids to really be motivated with work. And it was funny. I, I heard this joke recently and it was funny, this teacher who I love and she's hysterical. She said to her student, I see you missed class yesterday again. And the student laughed and said, yes, but I didn't miss it that much. (laughs) And as silly as it is, I think sometimes when we all get burnt out and when we are just struggling, we do just check out. And I felt that today, Robin, I think I I was a little bit checked out by by around four o'clock. And I know we're we're recording in the evening, which I know a lot of times we record in the morning and I sound fresh and happy, but catch us at the end of the day and you might get some raw stuff. Yeah, it'll be a good one. Well, I'm really excited about tonight. Dana Patton is going to be joining us. And Dana is a special education teacher. I'm trying to remember how long ago I, I met Dana, but our connection and came together. Jackie, it was through soccer. And she was my daughter and Dana. They coach together. And then Dana is continued to coach. And it's my granddaughter's coach for soccer. So we just think she's phenomenal and so excited because she's going to come and talk to us today about online education. Welcome, Dana. Hello. How are you guys? Well, obviously, Jackie's not so <laughs> great. <laughs> you know, those days, right, I Dana? Do. Oh, man, do I ever. <laughs> Especially in special education, we have seen it all. <laughs> oh, yes. So tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Well, I am a special education teacher and an autism specialist. I am a mother of four, so been down the parenting road for quite a while. <laughs> uh, I have four kids in sports, so it's a very busy household. But my main job during the day is a special education teacher. Um, Sometimes we call them like a learning support teacher. And uh, basically that's what we do. We support kids as they are learning. Did you always, Dana, know that you wanted to be in education? Like, was that something early on you were like, this is just meant for me? Or is that something that kind of came just from your own experience? Yeah, I have always wanted to be a teacher. When I was little, probably eight or nine years old, I would go home in the summers and the teachers would send me home all of the extra worksheets and all the stuff they didn't want to (laughs) shred. And they just sent it home with me. And I played school at home during the summer and I taught my doll and my friends that would play with me and I've always wanted to do that and educate people. Haven't you guys found that a lot of people who are teachers will say that, that they knew from a pretty early age, I wanted to be a teacher. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I got to say, I don't know that I was playing teacher when I was a child. I think I was <laughs> I, I was the challenging kid as a yeah. child. Not like, if anything, I was probably the kid that you were teaching. But yeah, no, I, I, I think 
you can tell when you meet a teacher that's truly meant to be in the field that they're meant to be in the field. How long, Dana, have you been a teacher? Is that something that like since right I got of college when you were younger and it's just evolved or is that? Well, initially I did go to college to be a teacher, but life happens, right? And <laughs> I became a stay-at-home mom for a long time and had children really quickly. I had four kids in five years and got overwhelmed with diapers and all of the things and uh, kind of got sidetracked from what I actually wanted to do. But I still found ways with my own children to teach and, you know, do preschool things at home and all of that. But then when they all kind of got back into school, I went back and got my master's and worked on building my life that I had always dreamt of. So this now I'm in my fifth year of teaching, but this is my eighth year in education. So while I was getting my master's, I was working as a paraeducator uh, in the schools. Oh, you know, it's so interesting. I don't know if you find this little kids, especially are such sponges, right? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I haven't talked about this before, but when my kids were little, we actually lived, I think my child, my youngest was eight months and my oldest was about a year and a half. And we lived in South America for two or three years. And it was interesting. They picked up the second language just like that, right? They were speaking yeah. Portuguese fluently by the time they were three and four. Me and my husband couldn't say maybe hello. <laughs> it, came, <laughs> it came off awkward. And I remember when they were younger, I did not work for a couple of years because we were in South America and I did not speak Portuguese and that would have been challenging to work. But I remember I would teach them things focused on eye contact and manners and like just even taught them like small things every day. They were like sponges. And I found that kids between, I don't know if you found this too, kids between like one and five, they suck it all in. Yeah, it's the best time to learn all of those important things. Right. And one of our most recent episodes, we talked a little bit about little children learning and exposed to tech so much. And we talked about how that is such a critical time for them really to learn some of those things. And so I'm excited to have this conversation and to have you really talk to us about what you're doing in the world of education and how that's evolving. Absolutely. Dana, what you do is online education, right? Yep. What do you call it? I mean, is it online education? Is it cyber school? Is it virtual? Like, what is the right name? Or is there multiple names out there that you use? I think it, it varies. Some people say online school. I typically say virtual learning. I don't think I've ever heard cyber school. The virtual learning or online education is the, the two things that I've heard it called. Okay. What brought you to online education? Uh, the life change many of us had was the pandemic <laughs> in 2020. And my school that I was teaching at in person was deciding to stay in person. And my own children didn't go to the school where I worked and their school was doing all online. My youngest was in first, second grade, maybe second grade. And I did not feel like I could just leave them home and expect them to do their school. So I had to look for other options. Was that a difficult decision? I think it is. It's always difficult for a teacher to leave a school. And I had to leave all of my students that I had been teaching and pouring my life into. And that was really hard to walk away. But my own children and their education is very important to me. And I did not want to leave them by the wayside. And so I chose my own children in that instance. For many, we've had a lot of conversations. Pandemic brought a lot of online to write into many homes. Mm -hmm. And so many families experienced, this is really great. We can do this at home. And I had many students that I've worked with that had, you know, issues with school anxiety, school refusal that really like took to online education. I've been working with a few therapeutic day schools that have moved to online as an alternative for children that struggle in regular mainline school situations. And so it's interesting. What would you say most families experience like in terms of a typical or accurate view of online education? I feel what most people experienced during the pandemic was not mm -hmm. actual virtual learning. I think it was probably a placeholder or kind of a let's get through this kind of a attitude where what can be is much more than what was. And I felt like my own children really kind of fell behind in a lot of ways in that whole year because they just didn't learn as much as they could have or they would have if they'd been in person. Just a lot of teachers that had never done online before were forced into it right. and expected to do the same things. And it's just not possible without the resources that they really needed. Right. Yeah, it was just a sharp learning curve, everyone, yeah. and your heart broke for the kids, your heart broke for the teachers, just yep. everyone was trying to 
punt this and no one quite know how to do it. Right. Well, what we found, shared this before, somebody had approached me before the pandemic. They wanted me to do a Zoom presentation. And I was like, no way in heck am I doing that. <laughs> and then obviously through the pandemic, we've done hundreds of Zoom presentations. And, and what we're finding now is parents love them. We're learning how to do them and do them well. And we have sometimes 300, 400 parents attend and they love the fact that they can be in their homes and they say they learn so much better. And so it's been challenging for us to change and adapt and pivot, but we're finding that the parents, and I would say even the students are enjoying it in some ways. And I love how you just said that if it's done right, if it's yeah. done with structure, you know, if it's done with the right amount of support, if it's done in the right way, it can be really, really helpful. Would you say that there's a typical student that it fits better for, or would you say it's more what it looks like and how it's, how the approach comes through that really makes a difference? I don't know that there's a typical student. I, I don't think any school has a typical student. All students are unique and have different needs. Um, even the ones that are successful have different needs. But I help all students with varying forms of needs. Typically, the kids that I see that really do thrive are the ones that maybe don't thrive in brick and mortar schools, um, mm -hmm. the ones that have social anxieties, or maybe they just need some time to grow through those anxieties and those concerns that they have in school and then maybe go back. You know, maybe we are just a temporary fix while the student matures and grows and works through some of those things. We, I have kids that are in therapy and working on those things while they also don't fall behind on their education. So I, I feel like those are the kids that I see the most that it actually helps to have this online education so they don't fall behind. Mm -hmm. You know, I love how you said that because I think you said it's not so much about does it work or does it not, but it's it's not meant to be end all be all. It's meant right. to be in conjunction with maybe therapy or with activities outside of the home. And I think yeah. where people get a misconception about online learning is we're not ever saying that we want kids to be by themselves in their home all the time on tech, on online learning, but we want it to be a useful tool for those kids that may not fit in regular, you know, I love how you said brick and mortar schools, but they're using it in conjunction with activities, a job, you know, uh, therapy and things like that. And also, and I have found with working with uh, certain online educators, and I'm sure you're similar, you can be as engaging as you want through online and you can also be as unengaging as you want, right? So exactly. We were right. We saw yeah. that in the pandemic where, you know, I love and you'll know all the the terms, but we're where teachers were using like those fun classrooms and the Google Meet classrooms mm -hmm. and all these different cartoons and sending postcards home and phone calls to engage the students. And so it's really not just about is online a good fit. It's how the online is really brought to the student and the family. Because I do believe and I have seen it, it can be engaging and there can be a place with certain students that maybe, and I'll be honest, I was one, Dana, that right. the typical school is not the best fit. Yeah. I was talking about this with a boy today and, and his confidence is really low. He's in college and he has ADHD and he needed a lot of intervention in school. And if you're a child that has a lot of ADHD and emotional behavioral issues, you constantly kind of get this message of you don't fit in. You're not fitting into this structure and, right. and you're not, right? So I love the fact that you're offering an alternative. Yeah. Yeah. It's And it's perfect for, for kids like that. Yeah. I've got a client that I've started working with and it was really interesting. They came in last week and said, I think I want to go next year to in person. It was the right fit. Just like you guys are talking, there's a history of some trauma. The child really struggles and this is the right fit for the child right now. But now we're really working on how to get the child back because now the child has that desire to go back and be in person. So I think that is something to be thinking about. It's not just an all or nothing kind of way to think about it. So Dana, core classes, how do they get extras or specials that kids typically get in these brick and mortar schools? How does that work for virtual learning? Yeah, so we offer at our school, uh, we offer a ton of different classes other than core classes. So the electives are numerous. We do coding and medical terminology and animation classes, photography, tons of foreign languages, which sign language is included, which I've never seen in a brick and mortar school, music classes, journalism, sports management, psychology. It's a ton of classes that we offer. 
outside of just your core classes. Even PE classes, they do a lesson with a teacher and they do like workouts and things like that. Oh, so really? Oh, oh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's a ton of different stuff that we offer other than just English, math, science, social studies. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the schools, and Jackie mentioned this, where we're seeing that blending happening mm-hmm. where, you know, some of it is for virtual learning, but they're also in an actual physical school building. Any thoughts or suggestions that you would have for parents in this space? Yeah, I honestly think that it's a great option if the school is willing to do that. That is a school by school call, I think. I don't, honestly, I don't know if it's a statewide thing yet. I think every school gets to decide if they will let kids come part time. I think it's fantastic. The kids can get some of their socialization in and they can play sports and, you know, all of those typical things at school, but also have a flexible schedule of some kind to be able to do their online, maybe core classes online or something like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great option. I don't think all of the schools are open to that quite yet. What I've seen it too, for those athletes that were pretty high level, right? And really gifted athletes. And when they're spending a lot of time on the ice or they're doing those type of things Mm -hmm. that they're able to do the online and then also to be able to be involved in their school because they spend so much time in the gym or in the water or on the ice, whatever it may be, this has helped them tremendously to still stay on top of education and do what they need to do and not feel so stressed out. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. And I don't know, you know, I've had many students recently have like in-school suspensions for like leaving and ditching lunch or going off campus. And it's interesting. A lot of the the kids that I've been working with have like IEPs and things like that. And they've been put in these in-school suspensions rooms. I would love to see this even kind of blend in with that, kind of being creative about how we're using discipline and restorative practice. I mean, I think there's so much that we can learn about the online learning and online engagement. I know Robin and I have been using it a lot for families struggling with things like school refusal, where we've actually kind of been able to come into the homes virtually and coach parents into how to help their children get more engaged in homework and things like getting them to school. So I think there's so much benefit to it. Absolutely. I know there's a lot of students who struggle with executive functioning, organization and structure and just getting motivated. How do they do with this type of learning? So I feel like they kind of either sink or swim. They either figure it out and they get themselves organized. They have a a learning coach at home that can help them get structured and stay on top of it, or they fizzle out and they realize that online is not for them and they have to figure out something else. So I think one of the biggest successes that I see is when a student has a learning coach at home. A learning coach can be a parent, a grandparent, a friend of the family. We call them learning coaches to be all inclusive. If they have a learning coach at home, maybe not all day, but at some point in the day to check in with them. Hey, hey, did you finish your lessons today? You know, you had your live lessons at these times. Did you go? And just making sure and keeping those kids accountable. The learning coach is key to the student being successful. And the more involved a learning coach is, the more successful our students are. Interesting. That's awesome. Well, how do the students connect with each other? How do they engage? Because that was one thing I remember my grandkids said that they kind of missed their friends during the pandemic because they felt like they couldn't really connect. How do the kids do that? It's a great question. We have clubs at our school. I help lead the clubs and uh, get teachers to volunteer. And we do different clubs. We have Lego club, trivia clubs, dance clubs. I mean, it's, there's so many, whatever the teachers want. And I hear from kids about what they want and we try to offer the things that are interesting to them. That's great. And yeah. And then we provide the space and We just have conversations around those topics or play games or whatever it is and let them have those social times that's safely behind their screens where they can chat with each other and maybe come on camera sometimes, maybe not. It's kind of dependent on the teacher. But I think also in the classrooms, in the the online classrooms, Teachers can provide community. We have, I work with some of the best teachers I've ever worked with, and they are very good at providing that space and creating community among those kids and providing safe spaces for them to talk and be open and be vulnerable, even. I've seen so many relationships with these kids just blossom just because the teachers are providing that space. And maybe during lessons, they take a break and they chat about something that literally doesn't matter, but just providing a brain break so that 
that they can have a time in the classroom to just chat with each other and then get back to learning. And so I, I've seen so many connections being made with these online classrooms and this platform. Well, and it's interesting. And I think that that is key in what you just said. A lot of families and kids will say, I just want to be homeschooled. And they, to them, that they just want to be like in their rooms, you know, not having to deal with all the exterior. But I think truly making this work really does involve community, partnership, having structure, having routine. Robin and I always talk about our kids really need, especially those that are struggling with mental health or emotional issues, they need structure and routine. Yeah. Online can be a great resource as long as it's paired with other things challenging that engagement, right. challenging and having that structure and routine. And so, you know, it's it's something that you shouldn't rule out, but you also shouldn't assume it can work in like a silo. It needs to be really partnered with other things. And I think for some for some parents, they don't have the means or the ability to do that. And then it might not be the right choice. But for many families that can, you know, provide that structure, that routine, that outside engagement, it can be a really great resource. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Dana. This has been great. Are you ready for the three questions we ask all of our guests? <laughs> sure. You can do one, two, or all three. It's up to you. Okay. So the first one is tell us a funny parenting story. And this could be from your childhood or this could be your own experience. Number two is what TV family or movie would you want to be a part of and why? And number three is what does successful parenting mean to you? All right. Funny parenting story. I think about my my oldest child who continues to stress me out as he grows mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> challenge me as a parent. When he was about seven, he came to me in the morning and his brother was five. And he came to me with his backpack filled with who knows what, probably snacks and uh, stuffed animals. <laughs> and he he put it on, put his shoes on. And he looked at me, he said, well, mom, I'm headed out. I'll be back <laughs> at sunset. And I said, <laughs> you're seven, <laughs> you will absolutely not be leaving until sunset. I, I'm sure that's how I was raised, right? That's how we, we grew up. We just left the house at sunrise and we came back at sunset. But no, I was not having it. He thought he and his brother at five and seven were just going to go out into the woods what? until sunset. <laughs> <laughs> have a day exploring oh, exactly gosh. I said yeah. well I will I'll go with you I'm happy to we'll go out and do it together so we we made a day of it and went outside but I did not just send him out by himself so uh the second one the tv family I would want to be part of is modern family I yeah, that's a good one I yeah. adore that show and I love how real it is about what people face and uh, you know families face and the challenges they face and they always seem to work it out somehow um as tv does um <laughs> but i feel like they tend to work things out in a pretty healthy way and i love that yeah i like it too um the last one successful parenting to me um it means listening to kids as a kid i always felt like adults didn't listen to me and that really bothered me and I really like to listen to young people, which is one of the reasons I teach. <laughs> I teach high school. I love listening to what they think and what they what they imagine, or what they want. And I just prefer to, to talk with them, hear them out, and try to, especially as a parent, try to ask my kids to do things rather than demand things to be done. I remember my mother would say, go do the dishes. And I'd say, well, I was going to do them until you just told me to. And yeah. I heard myself say to my son, will you please do the dishes? And he was like, well, I was going to until you asked me. And I'm like, I was like, well, I asked a question. I didn't demand it. Come on, give me a break. We can't win. We cannot I, I, win. No. There's no winning. Well, thank you, Dana. I thought this was absolutely fabulous. I really appreciate the time and you've come and, and talked to us and our listeners. Yeah, thank yes. you for having me. I love chatting about teaching. I mean, it's half my life that I live. So thank well, you. Well, and I think this is going to be something that we're going to see more and more of. And I think for a lot of us, we just, we don't fully understand it yet. And I think we're learning. So I think this was a good, a good start to many conversations we're going to have. And and I was the child that packed my suitcase at seven and, and said, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think my parents taught me and I I think I made it to the garage and then I came back yep. and it was, it was a Snoopy suitcase and nonetheless, so <laughs> I don't know that I was getting very far, but thank you so much. And, and this was great. And I love all that you do to contribute to school and education and sports. And we were excited just to have a, a few moments with you at night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks listeners. Thank Bye, you. Jackie. Bye. 
Thank you for joining us and make sure to subscribe and like us to catch our next episode where we will take you on a journey to find new ways of successful parenting.